pray together. Father, we come to you and we thank you. We give you praise because you are Lord of all. You sustain and hold all things together with your word. Lord Jesus, we praise you for in you all things consist and they also are said to hold together. For you are Lord and you are also our Savior. That you defeated our sin and the sting of sin, which is death. You conquered and res resurrecting and coming out from the tomb. For now you live so we can pray to you. We can ask you for help. We can call upon you and you hear us because your blood has taken away all our sin. You are a holy God and you have called us and made us your people. So we ask that you would be honored in us, that you would receive praise through us, that we would be able to walk by your spirit and give you honor in all things. So we ask that as we open your word and read your book, that we would be taught by your spirit and changed. For the glory of Christ and his church, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. And if you would, grab a copy of the scriptures, either your own copy or there should be one under your seat or under the seat in front of you or even on your phone or some like thing, and make your way to the book of Ephesians. We're continuing our study through this book that we've been going through the last several months, and we're picking up right where we left off last week, looking at verses 15 through 21 of chapter 5, uh, the th continuing our theme of walking in spiritual wisdom. And last time we looked at knowing the will of the Lord, and this week we're going to hone in on verses 18 to 21, and there see walking in spiritual wisdom means depending on the Spirit, depending on the Spirit, but we'll get there momentarily. First, I want to open with this quotation. Contributing to Desiring God, David Mathis wrote this, I can flip a switch, but I don't provide the electricity. I can turn on a faucet, but I can't make the water flow. There will be no light and no liquid refreshment without someone else providing it. And so it is in a limited sense for the Christian with the ongoing grace of God. His grace is essential for our spiritual lives, but we don't control the supply. We can't make the grace flow, but God has given us circuits to connect and pipes to open in case his grace is there. He continues and says, and we can ready ourselves for receiving along this regular route, sometimes called the spiritual disciplines. Such practices are not fancy or highfalutin. They are the stuff of everyday basic Christianity, unimpressively mundane, but spectacularly potent by the Spirit. While there's no final or complete list of such spiritual disciplines, the long tally of ha helpful habits can be clustered into three big groups. Hearing God's voice, having God's ear, and being with God's people, or simply the word, prayer, and fellowship. This is how we depend on the Spirit. This is how we're equipped by the Spirit that we might walk in His power and fulfill His will. Continuing on in the article, David says this. He quotes Don Whitney, and he writes, Think of the spiritual disciplines as ways that we can place ourselves in the path of God's grace. And seek him as Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus placed themselves in Jesus' path and sought him. Or as Jonathan Edwards puts it, we can endeavor to promote spiritual appetites by laying yourself in the way of allurement. Meaning putting yourself in the places where the spirit moves. And where does the spirit move? He moves through what we call the means of grace or the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. He continues, God's regular channels of grace are his word, his ear, and his people. So often he showers his people with unexpected favor, but typically the grace that sends our roots deepest truly grows us up in Christ and producing, produces lasting spiritual maturity. That's what we've been talking about in Ephesians. It streams from the ordinary and unspectacular paths of fellowship, prayer, prayer and Bible intake in its many forms. He concludes saying, while these simple means of grace may seem as unimpressive as everyday switches and faucets, 
Through them, God regularly stands to give his true light and the water of life. Paul shows us here as well in Ephesians and some other texts that we're going to look at this morning that the spiritual disciplines, the means of grace, are the first step that we must take in depending on the Spirit and his work in our life. This is how we tap into the Spirit's power. This is how we depend upon him that we might grow spiritually. And it's so vital for us, if we're to rehearse where we were last time, if we're going to walk in spiritual wisdom. Son, verses 15 to 16, that we are to walk in wisdom. And how do we do that? First, we do that by knowing what God wants. We know what he wants. We know his will. But then to be able to do this, to walk in obedience, we must, secondly, depend on the Spirit's power to do it. We must depend on the Spirit to empower us, to cause us to walk in His ways. And what's the first step we do to make that happen? It's this, the means of grace, the spiritual disciplines. This is how we can grow and equip ourselves, put ourselves in the path that the Spirit will, where He blows, so to speak, where He moves, that we can grow in our spiritual life, walk in wisdom, and live this changed life. So let's review briefly where we were last week to kind of run up into verse 18 to start anew. And if you remember last time, we talked about the main command there is walk in wisdom. We see it there in verses 15 to 16 of Ephesians 5. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. The first place we stopped in this text last week is to see what we're called to what this overarching command is, and it's to walk in wisdom. And we saw it's to consider who we are, our lives carefully, how we're living our life, and seeing then how we walk. Because you note, in my translation, that third word of verse 15, look carefully then, or your translation may say therefore, is hearkening back to where we were earlier in the text, right? Because you remember Ephesians, we've hit this almost every week, right? Those first three chapters were all about who our God is. What is he like? We discover that he's merciful to sinners. He's abounding in steadfast love. He shows grace to those who don't deserve it. He is so gracious and loving. that We're discovering who our God is. And then there's this transition that happens in chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore... Paul says, in light of what you saw about our God, this God that you now have a relationship with by grace, that he has called you to himself, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, therefore, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Because you have this relationship, it should be played out in your life, the way you walk, the way you live, what you do. And so he's been rehearsing now through chapters 4 through 6, All of the implications or ramifications of a relationship with this gracious God. So we saw it there first in verse 1 of chapter 4. Walk worthy of the calling. Verse 17 of chapter 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. Chapter 5 verse 2. We are to live and walk in love as Christ loved us. And in verse 8 of chapter 5. Since there's been this change, since Christ has made us light, we ought to walk and live as children in the light. And on a similar note, that's where we come into verse 15 of our text. Chapter 5, look carefully then how you walk. Your life must be changed. You know this God, it should be seen in the way you live and what you do. But then you ask, what does it look like? What does it look like when one walks when one lives a life of spiritual wisdom, when they're walking in spiritual wisdom. And we saw the first way of that is you got to know what to do. You need to know what God's will is for you. You need to know what God is calling you to. What does it mean first to walk in wisdom? We need to understand what to do. We need to know God's will. Verse 17. Therefore, in light of this, in, in light of walking in wisdom, therefore, don't be foolish But understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be a fool. Understand what God's calling you to. Understand his will. Understand his desire, his directive will, what he's commanded us to do. Get into his word. Know what he's called you to do and put it into action. But as we concluded last time, 
If it was only that easy, right? Just obey. Read the word and just obey it. Just obey, he says. It's supposed to be easy, he says. Right? No, it's not going to be easy. Because the days are evil. The world and Satan and even our very old selves are against us. Working against us to walk in wisdom and walk in obedience to Christ. There are many temptations from without and from within. But we have not been left alone to our own devices, our own efforts in this spiritual battle to be like Christ and to obey Him. God has given us His Holy Spirit to motivate, to influence, to empower us to do God's will. And so that's the second half of this how do we walk in wisdom. First, we need to understand what to do. And then we need to, second, how do we do this? We depend on the Spirit's power to do it. You need to know what to do, and you depend on the Spirit to empower you to do so. Or in the words more particularly here in Ephesians, that you are filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So to walk in wisdom, we, we must know what to do. But as we look at Christ's life and the commands he calls us to, I think it is easy then to despair and say, how can I do that? How can I live like that? How can I be gracious and merciful and loving like he was? Because I know my heart doesn't move there on its own. And part of this is good, that we would despair of our own power, our own abilities to do this. But we need to know how we can do it, and so we must depend on the Spirit's power to do so. And this is where we're going to pick up in the text here. We must be filled with the Spirit so then obey His will and walk in spiritual wisdom. So let's see it here. Verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You notice again, just like Paul has done so many times throughout Ephesians, he has a put off, don't do this, okay, put off this action, and then he has a put on. And so the first part or component of this, of the put off of, so you can be filled with the Spirit is first, don't get drunk. Don't get drunk or so yield to the influence of other things, other substances, other powers. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine. Now why? What gives here? Well, it certainly doesn't appear to be, looking at the rest of Scripture, that it's that all alcohol or wine is inherently evil. For on the one hand, Jesus, of course, turned a whole bunch of water into wine. It was a miracle. That would seem odd to do if any consumption of wine was sinful. Let alone, Paul exhorts Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. He says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. So the matter isn't wine in and of itself. The issue is drunkenness. Drunkenness. For when one has become drunk, even as we say it, they are under the influence of it. Our judgment and capacities, when we're under the influence of wine or alcohol, what's happened? Our, we're skewed in our thinking. We've been drunk and we've been overcome by whatever substance and our thinking is altered. You can't think right and you can't walk straight. Your judgment is hampered and even perverted so that you would do things that you would never do sober. Or better said, wine weakens your judgment. It weakens your self-control. And so the indwelling sin in you, the old man, he comes out all the more easily. Because you're giving over to that old substance. The old you. You're under its influence. Here's Isaiah 5, 11, And this was an exhortation to Israel's leaders. It says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. And then later in that chapter, in verses 22 through 23, it talks about their skewed and corrupted judgment because they're given over to wine. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who acquit the guilty for a, bri- for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. Don't be a fool. 
Don't be under the influence of other things. Don't weaken your capacities to fight sin and think clearly. Don't get drunk. For Paul explains that it's debauchery. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Here, Paul puts points to the woeful outcomes that happen when one has weakened their thinking, that they're not walking in wisdom, they're given over to debauchery or dissipation, or the Holman Christian Standard gets it right when it says reckless actions. One Greek dictionary defined the word as behavior which shows lack of concern or thought for the consequences or actions, senseless deeds, reckless deeds, recklessness. That is, it's what you do if you don't even think about it ahead of time. Have you ever said, why did I do that? I wasn't thinking. Or perhaps, maybe you haven't done that, but maybe you talk to your children after some moment of disobedience. Sometimes the first thing I ask, foolishly so perhaps, what were you thinking? What was going on in your mind? And then they tell me, quite honestly, I don't know. Exactly. And sometimes we don't know either. We weren't thinking. And in light of what we've seen in verse 15 here, we weren't being very careful. Without care and diligence, or by imbibing any substance that dulls your senses and decreases your spiritual thinking, it's just not wise. And it gives you over more easily to the default setting of sin in your heart. That Again, that way of the old man. Ephesians 4.17, I remind you. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And how do they walk? In the futility of their minds. It's hard to be sharp in your thinking. It's hard to be wise. It's hard to be careful with your life when you're drunk. Really, it's impossible. But in a similar way to how the overflow of wine or any substance that's over our influence... In that same way that it influences us for the negative, we're called instead to submit to another influence. To submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's influence, empowerment, and direction. Which, of course, is entirely for the positive. We're called to be filled with the Spirit. We're called to be filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But in that place, be under the influence of something else, be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does it mean here to be filled with the Spirit? Because I thought, right, that those in Christ, we already have the Holy Spirit within us. How can I be filled with something that I already have? And and indeed, if that's your question, you're right. We do. We do have the Holy Spirit if we're in Christ. Remember, Paul gave this assurance in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, in him you also, in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He was writing them to assure them, yes, the Spirit's in you, and you are then sealed and promised, and you will possess that final day when you will see him face to face. So what does he mean then, being filled with the Spirit? He's clearly writing to believers. That is, if we have the Spirit, how can we be filled with something that we already have? Some have wrongly suggested as well that this is a special experience of the Spirit after your conversion. That is, you come to Christ, you're sealed with the Spirit, but then the Spirit jumps in your life for a like a one-time launch into a whole stratosphere of 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 the Christian walk, a whole new way, a second blessing. But again, that's not consistent with the rest of the New Testament testimony about the Spirit. Rather, to be filled with the Spirit is to be under the Spirit's abiding influence. To be under the Spirit's abiding influence, His empowerment, His direction. It's to walk moment by moment depending on the Spirit. At conversion, the Spirit dwells us and dwells us, but throughout our Christian growth into Christ's likeness, we are yielding and depending upon the Spirit to cause us and move us into obedience. 
And note about this command to show that it's about this yielding and depending on. Note about the command. It's in the passive voice. Nerd alert for a second, but look at this. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. If it were active, it would say, fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, or get full of the Holy Spirit. So let's say you're outside, exercising yesterday, real hot. You were working on the house, or you were under your house, the dark dungeons under the house. Not that I know anything about that. And it's really hot. And you come into your house and you feel faint. And your spouse or your parent can tell. And so they caringly command you, fill yourself with this Gatorade or water that they rush to you. Get yourself full of this Gatorade. And so then you actively grab the drink, twist off the top, and guzzle down the liquid to get yourself filled, to fill yourself with the water or Gatorade. But it said this command is passive. It's be filled. You're no longer the actor. You're no longer the agent, the doer. You're simply the one receiving. You're the one being filled. So go back to that Gatorade analogy. You're dehydrated. You crawl out from under the house. You wander into the house. And, and you're, you're about to pass out and hit the floor. And your spouse or your parent runs over. And as you are hitting the floor, they run and grab you. They grab a glass of water. They kneel down. They lift up your head. They put the glass to your lips. And they start pouring the cold liquid down in your mouth. And as they do, they command you, let me help you. Receive this. Be filled with this water. Feel better. That's the nature of this command here. Be filled with the Spirit. You're somewhat passive. You're yielding to the Spirit's influence and control. Let the Spirit help you. Let Him empower you. Let Him influence you. Be filled and empowered so you might walk in obedience, walk in wisdom. One Bible commentator put it this way. Referencing the, the aspect of we receive the Spirit at conversion, but then we walk by the Spirit or we're filled with the Spirit through continual obedience. He said, with the filling, excuse me, with the indwelling, each Christian has all of the Spirit. But the command to be filled by the Spirit enables the Spirit to have all of the believer. The wise walk, therefore, is one characterized by the Holy Spirit's control. But before we turn to that question, because we want to know, well, how can I do that, <laughs> right? How can I tap into that power so I might walk in this? Before we turn there, we need to first look, look at and see what it looks like when we are filled with the Spirit. What does it look like when we are filled with the Spirit? That's where Paul goes next. And he shows to us the results of the Spirit's filling. The results of the Spirit's filling. When the Spirit is at work in your life, when you're under the Spirit's control and influence, here's what it will look like. And he lists for us three things. Let's take them each at a time here. The results of the Spirit's filling, verses 19 to 21, reads, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The first result of the Spirit's filling there in verse 19 is this, that we are singing outwardly to others and inwardly to Christ. When you're filled with the Spirit, when He's influencing you, you're singing outwardly to others and inwardly your heart is given to Christ. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you're controlled by the Spirit, you worship, you sing, you praise like the love-struck songwriter who's just encountered his love, like one overwhelmed by something so astounding they just break out in song. That's in some way the picture of what it looks like when the Spirit is at work in you. As we're controlled by the Spirit, the Spirit opens our eyes to see more and more of the greatness of Christ. We read about in 2 Corinthians 3. And the more the Spirit does that, the more we are depending on Him, then the more we worship, the more we praise, the more we bow down, the more we break out in song, in love and obedience to this God who first loved us. Like the psalmist in Psalm 98, 
Psalm 98. He sees the great salvation of God and he just breaks out in song. It reads this way, a psalm. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Why? For he has done marvelous things. He's reflecting on what God has done. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation. He's made it known. He's revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. He sees what God is doing and he says, praise God. He just breaks out in song. But notice, back to our text in Ephesians, who is first listed as the recipients of our songs of praise here? We're talking about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but look who first they're directed toward. Some went to me curiously. Verse 19. Addressing who? One another. Addressing one another. Yeah, spiritual songs and hymns, they, they are ultimately praise directed to our God because he talks about making melody in the Lord to your, making melody to the Lord with your heart, the end of verse 19. But the first hearers and focus of this text about what a spirit-filled life looks like is we're not singing first to God even, we're singing to one another. There's certainly a vertical element to our worship And he hears us and rejoices over us. But there is absolutely a horizontal element as well. Even commanded here. Our major component of our praise and worship to God is the corporate effect. What it means for one another. In other words, you're given to encourage and help and strengthen the faith of others through your collective praise. Your collective song together. That is, it might be good to sing songs alone in your car or in the shower. That's how you roll. But the spirit-influenced person wants to encourage his brothers and sisters with spiritual songs, reminding them passionately, reminding them about how great their God is. Picking back up in Psalm 98, remember he saw what God was doing and he praised God for it, but then he turns and immediately he, he, he's calling out an invitation for all those around him. Praise God with me. He says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre and with the lyre and the sound of melody. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. He's even calling to all creation. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. Our worship is not simply about our personal, individual worship experience, right? Right? It's about the collective praise that we give to him as we call one another, address one another, and remind one another in spiritual songs, calling one another to remember the greatness of our God. From our individualistic and Western mindset, I think it's really easy to forget and to ignore this this corporate component to our worship. You know, we turn down the lights, we... Turn up the music so loud you can't hear one another sing. And the church is the poorer for it. For I cannot tell you, even just personally, let alone what the scripture is saying, which is the most important thing. But personally, don't you know the encouragement of hearing your brothers and sisters who know you and know the Lord and they're calling out to praise this God? How many times have you come in with God's people discouraged and you hear your brothers and sisters alongside of you saying yes i know the struggles of this world too but yes we have hope that's what we sing about i see the work of the lord when you sing that's the spirit evident in you your voice serves as the strengthening and as a reminder that our god is real that he's here, he's working, and he's gracious. And your voices are calling me, hold fast, brother. May our voices be heard. 
So he emphasizes first those horizontal component. But as I mentioned, there's still, of course, in our praise, there's this vertical component that we are making melody to the Lord with our heart. That is, it's to be from the heart, sincere, engaging our minds and wills. Christ is calling not just for our lips, but for our hearts too. Now, the spirit-controlled person has so many reasons to praise reasons to praise God as he gives us the next fruit or result of a spiritual life here. That's number two here, giving thanks to God for everything. We have all kinds of reasons to praise God, and we do so because we're giving thanks to God for everything. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit-filled person's life is dominated, characterized by thanksgiving. Note that. Thanking God always, that's all the time, and for everything. And I think he's serious. That doesn't compute, right? Like I can think of some pretty awful stuff, either that has gone on in my own life or that I've seen in the lives of others. And a lot of those terrible things, how could I possibly be always giving thanks and so then for everything? How does that work? I would say in at least two ways. Let me address each one. First, to that question, always. Yeah, the spirit-controlled person can always give thanks because they have an inheritance, a loving relationship with Christ that trumps all other disappointments of this life. In a similar passage to this one, Colossians 1, verses 12 through 14, it says, if we're pleasing God, it looks like this, that we are with joy, giving thanks to the Father. Why? Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and the light. He's qualified you so that you can be called a holy one and be in his holy presence. How did that happen? He says, who's delivered us from the domain of darkness and he, this is his work, he transferred you to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom you have redemption, the forgiveness of your sins. Brother or sister, do not let your unbelief skew your perspective to see your salvation of your soul as a trite little thing. This was the great work of God to accept you as a sinner and he has done it because the cross is that powerful. I know some of you in this congregation, you've experienced terrible pain, loss and suffering, and perhaps even now, perhaps even now, your soul is tempted to despair. You see no reason or no way that you can thank God. I know some of you have seen great losses, crying, weeping, mourning, and yet still worshiping, still praising, still thanking God. Why? It's because of this, isn't it? It's because of the death and resurrection of Jesus on your behalf. Because he still loves you. Because he bore the cross to the end for you. And he will see it through to that. That he has not left you and forsaken you. That your very assurance lies in these things as you remember the cross. So you can say with the hymn writer, when Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and shed his own blood for my soul. Yes. But even then, I can always give thanks, but for everything. Really? How or why is that possible? Because we have faith. We trust that this one who gave his son who gave his son for me, that he can work in such sorrows and even turn them for good some way. Romans 8, 28. We know for for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And why do we maintain and keep this faith that all can and will actually work for good? Because all things that are of our life, of this providence, they lie in those pierced hands. They are set into our life by this one who has loved us, 
so much. And he will turn it for good as it continues in Romans 8 in that passage. What can we say to these things? That's why we know all things work together for good. What can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We look at our circumstances and we wonder, but we look at the cross and we know. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Because who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Those things are pretty rough, right? But in light of the cross, no, we know we are more than conquerors. Even through everything, we can give thanks. It's because of the gospel, what the gospel has done and declared, that we can always say and know, yes, he is for me. And only because of the cross. So the spirit-controlled The spirit-filled person will abound in song and abound in thanksgiving. But he will also abound in obedience to whatever roles and responsibilities that the Lord has called him. That's the last part here, submitting to one another for Christ's name. Submitting one another for Christ's name. See it there in verse 21. Again, the way the text is structured here, verse 21 is parallel with the singing and the giving thanks, just explaining further what a spirit-filled life looks like. ESV gets this perfectly by translating it as submitting, I-N-G, connecting to the giving thanks and the singing. Anyway, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to be rather brief on this point because we're going to pick it up next time, Lord willing. But let me suffice to say this. This is a call to submission to fulfill those roles and responsibilities to one another. Including submission where that's called for. Like wives to husbands or citizens to the government. But that doesn't mean those roles in this case are reversed. That is the spirit filled person is directed and empowered to honor the authority structures that the Lord has set up. So the wives submit to their husbands, and husbands honor the authority structure that's been set up. They don't go and then submit to their wives. Yet, they embrace the authority structure given. So they give themselves for the betterment of their wife to lead and to love and to sacrifice. Children are called to obey their parents. Now, parents are then not called to submit to their children. But parents are then called, fathers are then called to not submit to their children, but come to them and serve them and discipline and instruct them and love them and give their self for them, again, for the betterment of the family and so forth. We'll talk more about that next time because I want to go back to that question. So we see what the Spirit does in our life, right? You see it there. We, we sing, we encourage, we give thanks, and, and we fulfill where The roles God's given, we obey. But how? Well, it's by being filled with the Spirit. But how? What does it look like to depend on the Spirit? Let's turn to this parallel passage. Go right in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. What does it look like to depend on the Spirit? And to answer this question, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. As we read in Colossians, I want you to take note of the results in particular, what happens in one's life when Christ's word dwells in you. Look at what the results are of when Christ's word's in you richly. Colossians three sixteen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See if any of this sounds familiar. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Okay. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Familiar? With thankfulness in your hearts to God. What does that sound an awful lot like? Being filled with the Spirit. The result of having Christ's word in you are nearly identical to what being filled with the Spirit looks like in your life. I don't think that's an accident. The Spirit-filled life 
is the same as the word-filled life. Teaching one another, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual thongs, songs, thanksgiving to God. And even then, similar instructions, if you're just scanning, looking down from Colossians 3.16, similar implications to what this looks like in your life when the word and Christ's lordship is over your life. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and so forth. You want to have a spiritually powerful life? You want to heed and submit to the Spirit's control and influence more and more in your life? then get into the word. Get the words of Christ in your mind and in your thinking that his word dwells in you. It lives there. Not like the spec home you'll go visit, right? Or the the house for sale that looks like nobody lives there. It looks like a hotel room. Not like that. We want the word in your life. Messy everywhere you look. In the closets, on the desk, on the couch, God's word is everywhere in the forefront of your mind as you walk through your life. It's on the tip of your tongue. It looks like Christ lives in your life because you speak and think on his word so much. Fill yourself with his spirit by drinking deeply and often from his word. Depending on the spirit first looks like diving deep into the word of God. So how are you doing at that? How is the intake of the word of God, how does that look in your life right now? Are you making use of the means of grace that we've been talking about, those spiritual disciplines? Are you nourishing yourself spiritually? Can I remind you of a few ways to do so? Number one, the obvious one, personal Bible reading. Here's a way to grow in your spiritual nourishment. Get into the word yourself. Get up early. Make the coffee. That's a gift from God. And enjoy it alertly and get in the word. I think that one's obvious. Get a plan. Get accountability. Get into the word regularly. But two, how how else can we intake the word, let Christ's word dwell in us richly? It's when this happens. We gather with the saints for corporate worship. And I don't just mean what happens during the teaching time, so to speak, though that's very true. But think of all the ways that we are interacting over the word of God as we gather together. We intake through scripture reading. We read the word. That is probably the clearest and most useful part of the service because it's the least infiltrated by us. We are just hearing Christ speak to us. We intake the word through biblical and gospel-centered songs. We sing to one another, remind one another of these truths, and remind it of how great our God is and his mercy to us. Of course, we're intaking the word through the preached word as we proclaim it. We're intaking the word through real fellowship with one another. That is, not just conversations about what you did this weekend or what you're going to do, as fine as that is. But that's not necessarily fellowship. Fellowship is a communion. It's an interaction and encouragement over the work of God in your life, over his word. It's conversation around Christ and his work in our lives. So you're here. You're getting the word in. Good. But really be here. Be engaged with what the Spirit is doing through His Word. Don't just be present. Be engaged. So personal Bible reading, corporate worship, but even just the mutual edification that happens to one another, right? One-to-one Bible reading. Getting together with a couple brothers, reading through a Christian book together. Our bookstore, the book nook back there, it's not there to make money, We're there to make spiritual growth. Those are good books. Read them. They're filled with the scripture and they're filled with the gospel. You want to grow spiritually? Get in the word and grab one of those books. Another way that a brother or sister can help you tremendously is to memorize the scripture together. Probably no more powerful tool in my own life in walking by the spirit and being 
able to suddenly remember Scripture is when I've been working on it and memorizing it. The Lord will use that, recalling to mind those things you've been meditating on. You want to grow? You want to be led and filled by the Spirit? Get into the Word frequently and voluminously. But as you get into the Word, personally, together, after the service is here, oh, pray. Pray to the Spirit to work. God's not a vending machine. You don't put in the Bible reading, pull down the lever, and out comes spiritual growth. We are putting ourselves in the places where God moves when we take in his word. We must call on him, depend upon him. God, move and change me. Open up my eyes to see the greatness of your law. Psalm 119. Plead with the Spirit to open your eyes, to open the eyes of your brothers and sisters that we might see Christ as he really is. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, this is by the Spirit's work in His Word, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. And when we can see Him, what happens? We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's what we're praying for. So how can you grow in that this week? Growing in the word and pleading with God in prayer. How can you? Who is one person this week who you can help? And you don't necessarily have to be farther along, but that you can come alongside and strengthen and say, brother, sister, let's grow this week. I want to know more of Christ and walk with him. Help me. How can you eat better spiritually this week and help your brothers do so? Let's do that. Let's pray. Father, under those ends, we do pray. We ask that you would work in our hearts. Help us to be quick to speak of your word. Being quick, actually, to listen to you. And to come alongside and help one another that we might be dominated and led by your spirit, influenced and walking in obedience, walking in wisdom for your glory, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and admonish one another to sing to Jesus.